very warm welcome everyone to this uh, reinforcement learning Zurich uh, online session today. Um, it's great to see, see so many of you online. As you might have noticed on the flyer, uh, besides our long-standing uh, partner, Swiss Re Institute, um, which has been supporting us for since the beginning, basically, we now have uh, also a second um, uh, partner, which is uh, Rockstar Recruiting. Let's see here, I think. I think. And um, yeah, so ho hopefully some of their services can be uh, useful to some of you uh, at some point. So I will now hand over to Melinda, who is here, and she will say some introductory words uh, about what they're doing. Yeah, thanks, Klaus. Um, as you said, first time for us as Rockstar Recruiting um, sponsoring um, this event. I'm Melinda from Rockstar Recruiting, and basically, yeah, we bring together um, top talents um, in the tech field um, with innovative tech companies, both for um, projects and permanent positions here in Zurich mostly and Switzerland and basically we're closely connected to with um, ETH and focus on software engineering, machine learning and also big focus on um, data science. Many of our positions that we have are not an, um, on an official job board that you can find, for example, right now we're looking for a data um, analytics lead for an international fintech startup based near Zurich. Um, yep, if you wanna chat, I would be happy to just get in touch with it here um, in the chat box or LinkedIn. Um, yeah, wish you all a great event. Looking forward to the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda, for this introduction. Um, yeah, so to my our main agenda, so our speaker today will be Phil Winder. Um, Phil is the CEO of Winder Research, and uh, looking at their webpage, it looks like there's a lot of super inter interesting uh, data science projects going on. Also, he's an experienced speaker and lecturer, and uh, most importantly, he has written a, a book on industrial applications of reinforcement learning that you can see uh, here also. And of course, that's what we are very most interested about. Um, if you have been working on applying our industry, probably you, have, um, you agree with me that um, it's not only the technical uh, challenges which are important, but uh, also, first of all, finding the right use cases. So I think his experience with uh, five industrial use cases that he will talk about will be very useful for all of us. Um, now, before we start, for all of you, uh, one thing, you can write questions. So you should see here, there's a tab for questions. And I think you, you can also vote. Um, if you have the same questions, you can vote for some of the questions. And then we will go through them at the, at the end. Yeah, so with this, uh, I'll hand over to you, Phil. I'll okay, thank there. you very much. Yep, so I'm just gonna quickly start sharing my screen and bring up a presentation. There we go. Hopefully you can all see. Yeah, I think that's fine. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Phil Winder, and this is a not it's not a two it's not a long presentation, quite a short presentation, about thirty minutes hopefully, about some of the applications of reinforcement learning. Um, the reason why I wanted to to give this presentation today, and the reason why I wrote it in the first place, was because I've just written a book on reinforcement learning. It's it's for O'Reilly. And the whole premise and the idea of the book was, um, I, I, I was really inspired by, by a lot of the research and, you know, been reading a lot of academic stuff, but I, I rarely read anything from industry. And when I spoke to the companies and the clients that I work with and spoke to other developers and engineers, um, it, it became clear that the, uh, the, the, the premise of RL, although the premise is, 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 is sound, um, it was struggling to break into industry. And so the, the whole premise for the book was to try and apply some industrial, um, uh, you know, pr pr provide some, some, some tips and pointers on how to bring reinforcement learning into industry. Um, so I kind of wrote a lot of the the, 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 the final chapters first actually and it was it was talking a lot more about like how you do uh, reinforcement learning in production how do you operate it how do you you know design a project and how do you run an RL POC things like that 
Um, but when I've started talking to, to sort of, you know, a, 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 a variety of engineers, it became clear that they, they were also very interested in sort of the more fundamental aspects as well. You know, the, the, the algorithms, uh, the implementations and the applications. So it, it kind of swelled a little bit. The book got quite big and now it really, it's more of a, an end-to-end -end introduction to, to reinforcement learning, but it's still got a very strong thread of industrial use sort of running throughout. Um, so if you're, if you're working in industry now and you're interested in reinforcement learning, then uh, I think this will be a good, a good fit for you. You can find out more at rlbook.com. Um, it's not quite released yet. It's due to be released uh, on uh, about December the 1st, I believe. Uh, but that's kind of, it depends on the, the various uh, printers and stuff in, in various countries, depending on where you are. Um, so yeah, about six weeks to go, and then it's going to be released for, for general sale. But uh, you know, you can sign up on the website and um, you can also pre-order as well if you're interested. Um, Okay, so back now back to the presentation. Uh, so I wanted to make this a, a quite a generalist presentation. I didn't I didn't want to sort of assume that everybody is a pro at reinforcement learning. I know we've got quite a few people here um, in in this call, and I'm, I'm guessing that not all of you are pros. So um, apologies if you you are kind of knee deep in reinforcement learning. Um, this this may sound a little bit basic, you know, for you. But just to get everybody on, the, everybody on the same page, I want to try and explain reinforcement learning in a, in a, in a different way than the, what you might be used to. Okay, so the, the, I find the best way of explaining what reinforcement learning is, is by comparing it to, uh, you know, how animals and humans learn. Um, so you probably can't see the video too well because of the, the refresh rate of Zoom. Um, oh, I probably should have checked the settings actually, but it'll be okay. Um, but I'll, I'll try and pause it to, 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 to show you what's going on here. So learning through reinforcement is a, a fundamental, like psychological uh, and, and anim animalistic trait, really, of how animals and humans learn. This is a, a perfect example where researchers are training uh, a chicken to perform a task. And the task is, in this case, touch the pink dots, just peck at the pink dots. So whenever the chicken pecks at the pink dot, it receives a reward. And there you go. I don't know if you just saw that then, you probably didn't. Um, but now the chicken has kind of learned very quickly that if it pecks the pink dot, it receives a reward. Oh. Sorry. Don't know what happened then. Probably double clicked. Um, and these, these researchers are making the task harder and harder and harder, introducing more and more dots. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, eventually the... Uh, Keep pressing the wrong button. Ah, there you go. It's K. K is the shortcut. Okay, got it. And eventually, the chicken does a pretty good job of. Uh, I think I was just trying to pull out one particular instance here where the researcher. Here we go. So you see the the, the lady on the left. She's about to move the pink dot again, but the chicken is looking away. So when it comes back, it actually tries to prec it has predicted where it thinks the pink dot the pink dot should be but the, the cheeky researcher on the left has moved it so in that particular instance there's no reward because the chicken missed there you go found it eventually okay and working with birds specifically has been around for quite a long time this is so a video of some very old research from the 50s i think um rf skinner famous uh, uh sort of psychological researcher um, had worked with pigeons in, in the past. And in this experiment, he'd trained the pigeon to be able to read. So you see the, this, this command in the top right here. This is the command that the pigeon has to read. If the pigeon performs that action, then they are uh, you know, greeted with a reward that comes out of this slot here. And over time, the pigeon has just tried lots of random stuff and eventually stumbled upon the correct action. And here it's learned that when there is this you know, sequence of words, this, this turn word, uh, if it turns around, it's great. But it, it's actively looking at the, at the sign now to, to actually figure out what's going on. So now it's just being told to peck. And again, now it's being told to turn. So what's, what's the, the, the extent? Where, 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 how far can we take this? And I feel like that, you know, in the world at the moment, there's a lot of sort of nationalistic sentiment 
And uh, it'd be interesting to find out if that nationalism applies to birds as well. And it turns out it does. We've got a chicken here, which has been pecked, uh, uh, chosen to, uh, has been trained to peck just the Spanish flag. So this is a Spanish chicken, very proud of being Spanish. And uh, I do like this guy's t-shirt as well. It says, uh, my, my, my chicken is more intelligent than your dog in, uh, in Spanish. Um, so he, he really, he really loves his, his chickens. And if the chickens were ever able to take over the world, then they, were, they would even be able to raise their own little chicken flag. But every time, this is all reinforcement learning. This is all, um, you know, training uh, a, a, an, an animal based upon, she's not that impressed, obviously, but I'm, I'm impressed, I'm impressed. Oh, there you go, they're, they're, those guys are more impressed. All of that was the same. Um, we're all trying to, they were all trying to, to train an animal based upon um, providing reinforcement, positive reinforcement in order to, um, you know, eke out some kind of strategy. So where, coming back to reality now, how, how can RL help, help in, in industry? Um, where, what, what's missing and why is it needed and how can it help? Um, so I like to think of a business as being defined by several, um, I don't want to say actions, but they, 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 they're several different um, abstractions of process in a business. At the lowest level, there are business processes. And these are things that happen time and time again, uh, over and over again. And, you know, they represent everything from connecting your laptop to a printer to, you know, onboarding a new customer into your business. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, an abstraction layer above that is uh, are decisions and businesses need to, to make decisions. And uh, these decisions can impact how the business does business. So for example, uh, a decision as to whether give some, to give someone a loan or not would have quite an impact on, on the business itself. And then finally, at the top of that, that pyramid is strategy. Businesses have strategy and these are the long-term things usually divide, decided by a small number of people in order to guide the business into the future. And you'll see that, that there, there are links between these things, but generally when you define the strategy, that defines what decisions you need to make. And based upon that, you have the processes that you need to do to enact those decisions, okay? So you can kind of start to assign some kind of value to these things. At the bottom, we've got the business processes, which you, they are necessary, but they're, they're not very valuable. Like there is not that much value in you being able to connect your laptop to a printer. Um, but making a decision is a little bit more valuable because that, that usually involves some kind of um, you know, interaction with the customer and it may directly produce a return, um, but you know, um, it, 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 it may not. But in general, uh, the decisions are more valuable than processes. But then finally, and the, the, the real value comes when you start to define strategies. And the strategy is really the thing that can make or break a business. So it's very important for a business to get this right. And therefore, you can assign a large amount of value to that thing. Now, how do we map these different parts of the hierarchy to technology? Well, Software is really good at encoding and defining processes. Software is basically just a way of, 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 yeah, of coding up or codifying business processes. And they've been used this way for a long time and they continue to be used this way and it works really well. Decisions are automated through machine learning. Machine learning is capable of taking data, um, you know, maybe in a, a, a supervised way or, or, or maybe, you know, some other methodology, but basically we can use machine learning to, to automate many of the decisions, if not all of the decisions that, that are taken within uh, a business. And then finally, the top level, we've got RL. RL is the key to defining optimal strategies in a business, in a product, uh, in an application, you know, anything. That, that, that really is the key because machine learning isn't capable of defining these multi-step sequential long-term strategies. Okay. They're only good at sort of point solutions. So, so, so really the value of, of reinforcement learning in industry is defining those, you know, long-term, um, long-term sort of, yeah, strategic decisions. All right. So you probably already know this, but if not, let's just recap. So what do you need in an industrial project to be able to do RL? Well, 
there's two kind of what I like to think of entities in, in, in the problem. The first is the environment. This is the, the thing in which you are acting within um, the environment. Uh, let's take an example. Imagine you're learning to ride a bike um, or imagine you're, you're trying to teach a chicken to, to ride a bike. The environment is, you know, the, the grass that you're riding on, the, the, the sound that you hear, the pain from that you, that you feel when you fall off. It's the things you can see, you know, it's all of that information that you can gather. Um, and you can also uh, uh, act within that environment to change the state of the environment. The agent is, is the chicken or it's you or you, it's the person, it's the thing making the decisions as to what to do next, basically. Um, the agent can uh, suggest an action which changes the environment in some way, and then the environment responds with some state. Okay? The agent uses that state to choose its next action. So it's, uh, it's very recursive, very continuous, lots of feedback going on. Every now and again, it doesn't have to be on every step, but every now and again, the environment also produces a, re a reward. So that reward could be falling off your bike, it could be pain, it could be negative, or it could be positive, you know, the, 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 the feeling of, 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 of freedom as you, you ride the bike through the, through the field. And that's it. You know, that is the, that is a, a, the, the, the definition of a, a Markov decision process. And that is the framework in which we place all of our ideas and uh, thoughts and, and, and data um, to, and, and, we can, and when it's presented in this way, we can, we can solve this optimally using reinforcement learning. Um, so, you know, so that's, that's a, a bit of a background and the, really the, 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 the crux of the problem is, okay, well, that's all well and good, you know, presenting it in this way. Um, but what, but, but most of engineering, most, most of, most industrial work, it all works on prior art, on prior work. We need examples, we need demonstrations. And wh whilst I was doing my research for the book, I spent a long time kind of looking into these applications because I was really interested in, in them in, in, in general. And it, it dawned on me that after, uh, uh, you know, after a while it dawned on me that I thought that it, the, these things were quite hard to find actually, um, because you do have to sort of trawl through a lot of academic papers in order to find the, 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 the nuggets that are within there. So I started to collect and collate all of that, uh, uh, all of those papers as I was going through them and tried to kind of organize them into some kind of taxonomy. So on the RL book website, I've uh, uh, released a, a big sort of database of those applications and attempted to um, segment them by the industry that they come from. And uh, hopefully if you're, you know, if you're working in one of these industries, hopefully you'll be able to find a couple of examples which uh, are really applicable to what you're doing today. So I recommend that you, uh, you go and take a look there. I'll try and keep this up to date as, as best as I can moving forward. Um, and so from this, what I wanted to do was to try and come up with uh, a couple of key areas where RL was actually being used today. Um, and uh, if somebody was to ask me, you know, what, is, what are the most important industries for RL at the moment? these will be the ones that I pick. So the first one I want to talk about quickly is manufacturing um, and specifically robotics, the use of robotics in, in manufacturing. Ro robots have always been the number one kind of uh, use case for reinforcement learning because it's fundamentally difficult to try and encode the, 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 the movement and the, the actions of a robot uh, statically because there's so much that they might encounter. Um, so instead of trying to sort of codify and statically define the movements of a robot to perform a task, maybe you can learn it instead. And, and that's the approach that reinforcement learning takes. All right. Um, so the first example I've got is uh, an example of, um, you know, quite a traditional example of, of reinforcement learning in robotics. And that is using um, a robot that simulates a robotic dog and the, you, you could buy this off the shelf. You can buy this robot off the shelf from the manufacturer. And when that arrives, the robot comes pre-coded, pre, -coded, pre uh, uh, it comes with some predefined routines to allow it to you know, walk forward, walk backwards and turn and things like that. But what these researchers were trying to do was rather than rely on the, 
the, the, the, the predefined routines that were defining how this, this uh, robot walked. How about we actually observe what dogs do in the real world and try and apply some of the movement um, that real dogs make to this robot? And so they were looking into a, a specific uh, branch of reinforcement learning called imitation learning. And they were attempting to use that to, to try and learn what the animal does in the real world and apply that to a robot. And uh, when they did that, they started to come up with some, you know, quite unique movements that were, uh, you know, that the, 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 the manufacturer could never really envisage the, the robot doing. So we've got some kind of side steps going on here. Um, oh, let me just sort of explain the, um, uh, what the three images are. The image on the left is a reconstructed um, reference from the movements of a real animal in like simulation space. Then they have the simulation and this is where they did most of the, the, the training for that particular movement. And then finally, we've got a real robot on the right hand side where those, those, um, you know, those strategies, those policies were actually applied to in, in real time. So now we've got some cool little funky dance thing going on. It's a bit like a, I feel like it's a Bee Gees type, type thing. You know, the, the, the movements are really dynamic and the, this one especially, I think we've got a slow-mo in a minute, but, but this hop turn is, is really unique and I'm going to try and pause it actually. This is like a slow-mo video of that same thing and if I can catch it, uh, there, right? If you look at that image there, look at the joints of the robot. They're all in completely different positions in quite opposing yeah, quite opposing positions. It would be really hard to encode this movement because it's so counterintuitive. Um, but when you piece all of that together, you get this really, really cool sort of hop jump thing. So those kind of movements are really, really hard to encode in a real robot. Okay, example number one. Um, the second example I've got is something, I'm just gonna let this roll a little bit because it's a, a little bit of a long video. Um, it's, it's somewhat of a, uh, on, on the outside, it looks like a, a, much, a much more boring example, but I, I'm actually really excited by this one. Um, but first, let me explain what they're trying to do. So these researchers are simulating the task of rotating a valve. So imagine that you had a robot on like a um, uh, hazardous oil refinery or maybe on a big boat or something like that. Um, the task is to rotate a valve to a specific position. Um, the way that in, in which they're doing that is they are uh, training this three-armed, let me just try and pause it, this three-armed sort of, this, this robot with three limbs, and they're quite dexterous, they're quite maneuverable, and the, the, the cross shape in the middle is, is, you know, representative of the valve. The key, the cool thing um, about the research that, that these people did were that, um, there, so typically in the previous example, in the dog example, um, all of the motors, all of the joints inside the uh, robot are very highly um, uh, instrumented. So the, you know, they have uh, like accelerometers, they have um, encoders on the joints to know the rotation of the joint. They probably know the amount of torque being applied um, and so on and so on and so on. In this example, there is absolutely no instrumentation except for this video camera. This video camera, this, this, this camera, this image that you can see on the screen is the only thing that the robot can use to sense its environment. So it doesn't know where its limbs are. It doesn't know anything about the video itself. Um, it, it has to learn that purely from this video. And the other cool thing that they did in this experiment is that they uh, they, they use the video camera as the ground truth. So basically they move the valve into the position that they wanted to, um, uh, the, the position that they wanted the robot to move the valve to. They then took a snapshot, a screenshot of that image, and then sort of saved that as like this kind of supervised kind of buffer of what, of what the, the robot was trying to achieve. And did that quite a few times from lots of different locations. And eventually they had a, a collection of, of basically what the, the robot should be aiming for. And then purely from this video camera, they were able to, to build the whole you know, MDP and uh, build the whole RL paradigm. And um, yeah, ended up with this. 
So the robot was able to sort of manipulate and use its limbs to be able to nudge that valve into the right position. So yeah, uh, from, from the outside, a little, a little more boring, but I think this is really exciting because I think this provides a, a really useful and simple way of um, training a, a real life robot on, on real life tasks. You know, there's, there's a, it's really easy to install a video camera to do these kinds of things. All right. Um, something a little bit different here. Um, so a lot of people, when they haven't seen RL before, um, they're, they're, they're usually more impressed and surprised by some of the simulations that, that, that are happening. And, and this, is, this is a really good one. So these, this is an example of two humanoid um, agents. And uh, you can see the, the, the two humanoids in, in blue and red. Um, if, you, if you don't already know that, that a humanoid is, is, is quite a difficult beast to train because there's so many joints involved. Um, everywhere you see like one of these tubes on the people is, is, a, is a joint and they all have to work in unison to do interesting things like walk or run or, or, or whatever you're trying to do. In this particular case, they've trained the blue agent to kick a ball and it gets rewarded whenever it scores. The red agent it has been trained to try and save the, uh, the, the ball from going in the net. It's, you know, classic, classic game of football. Um, but this research is really cool. I mean, that, that's quite a, a typical kind of toy task, and it's a, but it's a good way of kind of demonstrating how, how complicated some of these strategies and policies can be. But the, the cool thing about this work is that the red agent is now trying to deploy adversarial techniques to be able to get to, to basically trick the blue agent into doing something stupid. And what it found was that if it just stumbled onto the floor and just, you know, curled up in a ball, the blue agent had never really in, experienced this before. The, the, the blue agent expects there to be a goalie in the goal. And when there is no goalie in the goal, it kind of does this cool little drunken dance and just falls over. Oh, I managed to get it that time. But most of the time, it does this weird drunken stumble and falls over. Um, so it's, it's, it's an interesting avenue of research there is the adversarial um, uh, attempts to, 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 well, I mean, the ultimate goal is to try and make these, these strategies and these policies more robust, right? The, the goal is not to, to uh, adversarially, you know, it's not to try and attack these things just for the sake of attacking them. It's to, to, to make them more robust. Uh, and that's going to be really important in um, operational uh, reinforcement learning. Um, as we've seen with, with operational machine learning. All right, but now we get to a, a, a real life task again, and this is, this is really cool. So this is a, uh, a real life robot in, um, in Berlin, and uh, it's uh, created by a company called Coverin AI. And the, the task here is, um, it's, it's, it's called pick and place. So it's quite a classic pr problem. Basically you need to um, pick one object out of one box and place it in another. And in this warehouse, all of the products are separated into these blue bins and they live on a shelf somewhere. And when somebody places an order, that box is pulled off that shelf, is put, up, put onto a conveyor belt and delivered to one of these pick and place robots. And then it's the responsibility of the pick and place robot to pick the object up, place it in the right customer's box, and then that box gets shifted. The hard part of this task is not all of that logistic stuff. I mean, you know, you, you need to write a lot of software, obviously, to get all of that in place and all of that working. But the hard part is actually picking up the object. So I'm just going to attempt to try and move this video on and pause it. Have a look at the objects in those blue boxes. So a minute ago, we saw a white box um, and, and a box full of white boxes. Now we've got a what looks like a it's an object in a plastic packet. I'm not sure if you can see that, but it's very small. There's another box. There's another box. There's a bigger box. Now we've got, yeah, more objects in a plastic kind of wallet thing. Um, that looks like some wire in a, in a, in a plastic wallet. I'm going to keep going because I'm looking for one in particular. Oh, there's a very small orange box there. Yeah, more boxes. Here we go. Look at that. That's brown tape. And tape is, is shaped very differently to a box. 
Um, so basically what I'm getting at here is the trying to hand code a strategy for picking up an object when you don't know what that object is going to look like or feel like or how sticky it's going to be is incredibly difficult. Um, but using reinforcement learning, we can learn optimal strategies to pick up any object. And you know, I'm just going to play this through now. And it does this incredibly quickly, packing all those boxes. And there you go. So that is a, a, a real life example of reinforcement learning in action in a warehouse today. Well, not today, a couple of months ago. Okay. Um, so the next area I want to look at is, is the tech sector, technology. It's, I'm, I'm being intentionally broad here, but what I mean is um, companies that have a large um, you know, software um, contingent within their company. So basically any uh, internet company, maybe e-commerce e companies, you know, anybody involved in, in technology. And the, the one example that I want to highlight is this really cool piece of research where um, researchers were trying to automate um, web-based tasks. So what we've got here is a HTML styled inbox. So if you look on the, the, the image in the top left hand side here, we have an image of some HTML which is simulating uh, an email inbox. We've got a couple of emails in there from Kyle, Bob, Anna, um, and that represents the state in our MDP. Um, the state is basically the HTML code. The action that you can perform on this state uh, is basically like jQuery, well, not, not like JavaScript selectors, basically, C CSS style selectors. And you can select uh, parts of that HTML and then um, act upon it. So you can, you know, if it's a link, you can click it. If it's a text box, you can type in it, things like that. And these are all kind of predefined actions that are appropriate for uh, that, that type of, of, of HTML that's being used. And given that, what the researchers did was came, came up with a whole wide range of tasks um, to achieve uh, and to, in an attempt to train an RL agent to be able to do them. So this is an example of a series of steps to uh, write an email. And so here we've, we've got the first date on the left hand side, which is your email inbox. Um, and the action, we were, well, the goal really is we want to write a, an email to Alice. So uh, the second state in the second image is uh, uh, clicking on a, an individual email from Bob. Uh, and then the third state is, uh, oh, uh, oh, sorry, we're actually trying to forward this email. Sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're clicking on the email from Bob, then we're clicking the forward button. And then on the third image, we're presented with this, this email, but with a blank two box. And then the fourth state is uh, after we've typed in the, the, the person, Alice. And then finally, we need to click send. So that's like an end-to-end -end sequence of what should happen. And the researchers went through and, and created lots of these scenarios and um, uh, attempted to, to, to train an RL agent to be able to do that. And here are some results from that research. Um, we've got two results here. There's, there's way more in the, in the paper and, and the accompanying website. Um, on the left-hand side, we have that email scenario that I was talking about. And in the yellow box at the top, we have the command effectively. It's going a little bit fast and it's a GIF. Apologies, I can't, I can't pause it. Um, basically, uh, the yellow box is saying things like, um, send an email to Anna with the text, you know, X, Y, and Z, or please forward Bob's email to Trevor, um, you know, things like that. And in the, in the, in the image below, below the, the, the command, you can see the, the, the agent acting in real time. It's going through and clicking on the emails, typing the text and clicking send. Okay, so this is the actual agent that's doing this. It's not a person that's doing this. The agent has been trained to do this itself. On the right hand side, we have a similar task, but it's, it's sort of applied to a different situation. So this situation is like a, a Twitter-like interface. So again, it's like a HTML mockup of Twitter. And the commands are kind of more Twitter related now. So it's you know, uh, uh, mute a particular person, uh, like the, the, the tweet from Horn, uh, reply to Horn using, um, uh, saying the, 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 the text, this, that, and the other. Okay, so again, lots of kind of natural commands that you might imagine saying to something in order to achieve a task. And again, the RL agent has learned how to do that 
and is is uh, sort of doing that uh, yeah as you can see in the, the gif there so i think that's that's really cool i think it's really powerful and I, I think this is a little bit gimmicky at the moment um you know because it's a bit contrived it's using these stylized html inputs but i, f I feel like that the, there is there is something there. there there is a really good idea there and there is a really good application of that idea somewhere i just don't know where it is um but i think it's somewhere within the tech industry so if you if you invent that yeah yeah get in touch with me and I will uh, happily accept those, those royalties that will come. <laughs> All right, uh, let me just do a quick time check. Yeah, okay, so 35 minutes, right? I'll just keep going for about five more minutes then. Um, the, the last one I want to, to talk about is, let me just check, okay. The last, the last area I want to cover is transport. Um, so, yeah. So I think I think there's a bigger picture actually. There's a bit there's a bigger problem here, and that's climate in 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 general. I think I think climate uh, climate problems, you know, climate change is going to drive probably through regulation, but it's going to ultimately drive a lot of technical advances in the future. Um, there are a lot of examples relating to power generation, power control, home energy consumption, uh, building energy consumption. Things like that, um, and you, you've probably all seen like the Nest thermostats that you can get now for to, to like automatically learn your uh, preferred heating schedules and things like that. That's basically an application of reinforcement learning. Um, uh, but there's lots of research now, a much grander scale, a much bigger scale. Uh, but transport's an important part of that because uh, you know cars are still a, a, signif a significant source of CO2. So if we can optimize the way in which people travel. Um, there's a there's a potential for a big saving there purely just from an optimization just just through optimization of traffic flows. Okay, uh, lost my page. All right, so this is a, a big collection of videos um, from uh, Science Magazine, and but it's just a, a, a nice collection of uh, of research that's going on at the moment. Um, one of the the biggest areas of research uh, in transport, which RL is being used for is for the optimization of traffic flow and the reason for this is that uh, traffic jams and especially kind of secondary traffic jams um, are some of the biggest causes of, of, of accidents on the road but also there there are sort of a clear link between sort of economic output and um, you know how much traffic is on the road if we can get people to get from a to b more efficiently then you know we're not only helping the climate we're, we're helping the economy and we're also saving lives so it's an important problem to try and solve um there's there's quite a different ways in approaching the problem but one of the ones that i found um that, that i've seen that i've I, that resonated with me the most was in the uk at least i think it's the same in most places in the world now but in the uk there's this idea of smart motorways and they, they use the word smart very uh, liberally there because they're not particularly smart. Basically, all it means is that somebody can control the signs on the motorway to independently alter the speed on certain sections of a motorway. So you, uh, an operator would basically set a, a speed limit on a, a stretch of motorway to you know, 40 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, things like that. Um, there's been quite a lot of research done which is, is trying to optimize uh, merging, so merging traffic. So that might be because there is a lane closed ahead due to roadworks, or uh, maybe there's been an accident or something and the lane's been closed, or maybe it's just a junction like this. This is an example of a junction of two, two junctions merging, two lanes merging into one road. And um, the researchers assume that it is possible to tell an individual vehicle, a single vehicle, to go at a very uh, a specific speed. And if you can do that, you can look at all of the traffic through video cameras or, or, or some other kind of sensor, and you can tell vehicles to go at a fixed speed in order to merge the traffic optimally where you know the idea is is that you wouldn't need to change speed people can just pull into a lane and they know that there's nobody going to be there because everybody's doing as they're told <laughs> it's still a little bit idealistic but you can see where the idea is coming from um, and you know that reduces in in less uh they, I, they call it rubbernecking here but you know when you get like the rubber band effect in in, in traffic jams um 
uh, it reduces the the congestion it reduces accidents so i th i think there's i think there's something to be said there and I, and i think that it, we don't have to have like fully autonomous vehicles in order to get there um so i'm really excited about that piece of research too okay so i've been talking for about 40 minutes now uh we've we've got no questions in the q a um, I'd just like to sort of finish this talk reminding you about the uh, the book. So just to recap, the book talks a lot about this. It talks a lot about applications, talks a lot about how to run things in, in, in operationally. Um, but there's also a lot of, you know, deep dives into specific algorithms and how they work and things as well. So um, uh, yeah, definitely check it out. It's being released in about six weeks time. Uh, go to the website. I've got lots of uh, workshops and um, you know, due to notebooks and things. And I'm I'm creating content all the all the time and uh, up up until the the release of the book. So um, yeah, sign up, check it out, and uh, join me on LinkedIn if you're if you're interested in following me. Or if you've got any questions, or if you are actively trying to apply RL to an industrial problem right now and you need some help doing that, please just reach out to me uh, via my website or via my email there. And with that, I'd like to, to open it up to questions. So feel free to type in the chat or type in the Q&A box. Thank you very much. I'll just leave the references up if you're interested in that. Great. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank you. It was a great talk. Nice overview. So um, usually people just start writing questions uh, at the end. Probably something will come up. All right, yeah, I'm just trying to... I definitely like your uh, your web page uh, with the collection of uh, RL applications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought it's that really was um, I thought that'd be quite useful um, to 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 sort of inspire as much as anything. Um, I feel like that if if you can see something vaguely related to the work that you're doing, I think it becomes much easier to take the next step and you know propose a POC to your you know to your to your boss or to your client, um, and you can use that and you can leverage that. As, as sort of prior work um, to prove that you're not, you know, your head's not in the clouds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And maybe you can even learn something from other industries and then uh, and apply it also. Definitely, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing that so I can get back to the chat. Here we go. So there's a question now. Ah, great, thank you, Mark. Uh, training RL in simulation makes sense, but how do we create realistic trading based on the data of multiple agents in your financial markets? So um, there is a big one, one big domain, subdomain of, of reinforcement learning is multi-agent reinforcement learning. And um, they have their own set of environments and their own set of simulations to be able to accurately uh, simulate multiple uh, agents all operating within the same you know, confines. Um, one example that springs to mind is some research from, uh, I think it was from Salesforce, some researchers from Salesforce, and they uh, used multi-agent reinforcement learning to model uh, efficient taxation policies for a governmental organization. So effectively, they tried to, you know, define this, this well, relatively simplistic simulation of uh, economic simulation, and they, you know, stuffed, you know, many, many, many agents within that that simulation, and then ran it to see what would happen. And interestingly, what popped out were were several different taxation strategies to optimize for things that the the the, the government was interested in at that particular time. So if they were interested in kind of you know, revenue, you would, you would apply one taxation policy. If they were interested in economic output, they would have another taxation policy. And so that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of a practical example of um, using multi-agent reinforcement learning um, for, uh, for, for, for that purpose. Um, yeah, but the, there's a key word in there, realistic. So that there, no simulation is realistic enough. It's, it's, it's not the same as it's not as good as as real world so simulations are great during development simulations are great to prove ideas and prove concepts but there has to be a moment in time where you you start operating in the real world because that is the only place where you actually come across the, the these really complicated uh, uh, situations yeah good question thank you 
Um, what's your views on using batch RL in cases where simulators are not available? Thank you. Um, yeah, that's that's another good question. I think that has a, a really a real, a real strong application of uh, uh, within industry. I think that that batch reinforcement learning for the, for those that don't know, this is the idea that you can learn an optimal strategy or an, an optimal policy from offline data. So imagine you're a, an e-commerce website and you have a massive log of interactions with your, your website. Batch reinforcement learning is the idea that you can use this offline data to train an agent where the sort of traditional um, reinforcement learning algorithms wouldn't allow for that because you have to actually act within an environment to actually learn anything. You know, you need to try the wrong action to learn that it's a wrong action. Um, yeah, and, you, and, and uh, batch reinforcement learning uh, tries to uh, circumvent that problem through various means. Most of the, the research that I've seen uh, are basically attempting to build a model of the data so that the RL agent can kind of interact with that model as if it was the real world. Um, I think there's probably more to come in that, in that area, but uh, that, that's, uh, uh, that's one to watch out for because I think that will unlock many applications where maybe um, actually interacting with the environment is either expensive or dangerous or, or, or both. Okay. Um, and are there applications of RL in the medical data domain, such as images of vital signs? If you said, do you have some examples? Yeah, so um, there is a section on the, on, on the website under, under healthcare, I think I, I, I put it. Um, to be honest, most of the examples that I can remember um, are relating to treatment strategies. There's been a lot, I don't, I mean, I'm not a, a medical expert, so I don't, I don't understand the healthcare industry um, in, in detail. But I can only assume that this means that treatment schedules and personalized treatment schedules are a particular problem in healthcare at the moment. And a lot of people are using reinforcement learning um, to do things like optimal dosing strategies. So if you, if you, um, if you need antibiotics, for example, um, uh, apparently you don't necessarily need like a fixed dose of antibiotics. You need, you need a, 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 like a, a dosage that is matched to the, to the current problem and if you you know continuously over abuse antibiotics then eventually some some of these diseases can can uh, form a, a resistance to that antibiotic so there's a, a, a strong push to try and use the right amount of antibiotics at the right time um, so that was one example another one was for um, uh, sepsis treatment um, uh, that, that that was another one that i remember and again it's like all, all about optimal dosing so that the, uh, the, the patient recovers more quickly. Um, so there, there are some of the examples that I can think of, but you, you're specifically asking about um, images of vital signs. So, so remember that the RL is, is all about trying to define optimal strategies, like these sequential decisions. Um, when you're working with like image related data you, you you think of like you know detecting cancer or, or, or something like that spotting things from x-rays but that rl isn't particularly helpful in those use cases because they are sort of one-off decisions they are there or not there um the rl would be useful if it was part of a wider or longer term strategy in order to solve that problem um yeah so hopefully uh that that uh, gives you a couple of ideas there all right, and uh, any applications use of RL, mobile optical network planning and optimization, which methods, for example, um, one, one network related problem that springs to mind that I read about that I thought was really cool was um, using UAVs to form wireless networks. And um, what the researchers were trying to do was to optimally place UAVs to maximize coverage and maximize network throughput. So that's, that's a, a really cool problem because it's got a couple of different dimensions. You've got like a geospatial problem where you're trying to put the UAVs in the right place, but you've also got like a, yeah, you've got other metrics of like um, bandwidth and throughput and stuff to be able to maximize those things. So you can imagine in a, in a, in a, in a city where you're trying to offer like full wireless coverage throughout a, a city that, that UAVs could, could all kind of um, you know congregate where the data was required at any one time, 
Um, and again, yeah, this is a classic reinforcement learning problem. And uh, I think you might find that interesting. So yeah, check out the, the website or have a search for that on the Google Scholar or something and you, you should be able to find it. There's quite a lot of um, very sort of technical um, network level optimization stuff going on as well. But to be honest, that's, that's beyond my, my knowledge. I think you probably know a lot more than I do about that. Um, yeah, we just got a follow on comment from Mark as well. Training an RL agent in real world financial markets instead of in a simulation could get expensive. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So that's why things like batch reinforcement learning um, uh, would, is, is incredibly, incredibly important in those kind of use cases because you do kind of want to back test. You do want to test that your agent works and train new policies from log data because it's, it's so expensive to, to uh, uh, you know, train in the, in the real world. But um, there's always going to be some element of training in the real world. And that's, that's the whole point of reinforcement learning um, because markets do change and, and, and circumstances change, situations change, and RL agents have the potential for learning on the job, as it were. Um, so that's, a, that's also a benefit as well as a risk. <laughs> okay. So... I think we've had some really good questions there. Anything else from you, Klaus? No, it's good. Thanks a lot for, the, for answering the questions. Yeah, it looks like, or maybe there's one, one more. Oh, one more. This probably, and then we close. Okay, good stuff. Doesn't the computational and time resource need training our real agent mean that in most industrial cases, there will be, this, there, there will be a more efficient approach? Um, so let me, let me answer that question first. So. So, so RL, RL itself isn't computationally expensive. The computationally expensive part is sometimes the simulation and also the models that are used within the reinforcement learning. So the neural network, basically. So if you're using deep learning in a very complex simulation, then yes, it will take a lot of resources and a lot of time. But I suggest that many applications can be solved with much simpler models, with much simpler simu simulations, um, maybe with batch reinforcement learning, maybe you don't need a, a proper simulation at all, maybe you can use offline data. Um, so if, if computational efficiency is a problem for you, then yeah, you can design your algorithms to work within the confines of those resource limitations. Um, so I wouldn't say that RL is inefficient just, just by definition. It's actually, uh, it's more due to the deep learning, uh, you know, the, 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 the complicated neural network models that are used inside these, inside reinforcement learning, that is the main cause um, for the, the computational problems. Um, a lot of industrial problems can be solved with, you know, simple Q learning sort of tabular methods. And, and those are really, really quick, really quick to train, they're really snappy. Um, so I, yeah, I, I would, um, I would, yeah, recommend that that is not as, as much of a problem as you think. Well, generally what problems would you recommend to address with RL? Well, I mean, that's, that was the, the, the bulk of this talk, you know, um, I, I'd recommend that you go and have a look at the, the applications page on my website and there's, a whole range of industries there with a whole range of, of use cases that have already uh, been demonstrated. So have a look through some of them and that should provide you with some inspiration um, as to where it can be applied. Um, but yeah, crucially, what you need to look for is the, the, is, 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 uh, is the strategy, it's the, the sequential decision making that needs to happen in order to build a strategy. If, um, if, if you ever sort of see a problem or or a part of the business that is doing those types of things, um, then RL could be a solution for you. But um, it's not a silver bullet. Like it, machine learning is, is still very useful and software is still very useful. That's not going to go away. It's just reinforcement learning is another tool in our toolbox to be able to solve some of these uh, you know, longer term problems. Yeah, exactly. So thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay. That was really great. Uh, thanks for your patience with the questions. Uh, so it's nearly uh, seven now, so we should close. Um, yeah, everybody. So uh, have a nice evening. Thanks for joining. And see you next time.
Okay, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, you can get in touch on LinkedIn or via email. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.